If you recall from where we left off in episode one, the Russian Empire was simply in shambles. Left in the wake of Tsar Nicholas's destructive policies, or lack thereof, and certainly lack of reforms, at the end of the Crimean War, the Russian Empire became the laughingstock of the world in this backwards, really horrible society and extremely incompetent leadership and horrible technological capabilities. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, in 1855, Tsar Nicholas I passes away. And with that, we now see a new Tsar come to power, Tsar Alexander II. But will this new Tsar continue in the old incompetent ways of his predecessor? Or will he give his people hope Will he issue much-needed reforms to his people, paving the way for the Mosin-Nagant rifle in just 35 years from now? This is Legends Never Die. One of the things that also helps illustrate how <laughs> just the disconnect in society in this time was this. Okay, these undersea mines. Remember I was talking about these undersea mines? So Russia had, it's basically a paradox. At this time, they had undersea mines and flintlock muskets, and they didn't have much in between, okay? So you have no technology, essentially, with flintlock muskets. You have just bare bones. It's horrible. But then you have these ironclad ships and other things where you have these, these crazy Swedes that came in and now give you these really cool mines that they made. And, well... They didn't win them the war, but look, they, they did some horrible things, and they, they look really cool when they blow up. Tsar Nicholas was far more interested. He would actually have ceremonies where he would just gather people to watch these mines explode. He loved these mines so much. This guy was totally useless as a leader. <laughs> but he was pretty cool. This is actually a, it's black and white, which I don't appreciate, but this is a picture of one of these undersea mines. And this one was captured by the British, this is a Russian mine, and it's in the British National Maritime Museum. So if any of y'all have access to that and be able to get a picture of it, I would love to get a better picture of it. Now this one's painted, <laughs> Russia probably didn't paint this one, I mean, this was probably painted by the British. It's an undersea mine, why would you paint it? It's just gonna blow up anyway and you can't see it because it's underwater. I don't know, very strange. But you have this disconnect. You have this really cool undersea mines and everything else about your army is just horrible. So in 1856, we have our Treaty of Paris. Um, and unfortunately around this time, I am so sad to report that we no longer have Tsar Nicholas I with us as much as we miss him. So in parallel to all of this happening now, he goes away. This is a really important time, 1856. Sylvester Kernka actually analyzes in real time what's happening with the Crimean War. He actually writes a book, which is published at the end of the Crimean War, talking about the technological gaps in armies and really what the future is going to hold for small arms development. And he says, hey, guys, I need you to take a look at this again. And what's really cool about this is it was actually uh, sent back to Vienna for testing. The second design, remember, this is the pinfire one we looked at earlier. And he was denied. Okay, that's strike two. Now, we have to ask ourselves at this point, why? Like, there's no, there's no really good reason here why he's still being just flat out rejected. It's not like they did extended trials or anything and said, eh, we're probably going to adopt this. No, just, nope, nope. Why? Well, this must have been really frustrating, but part of this, not all of it, but part of this actually comes from racism. Now, racism is an interesting word, and it gets overused way too much in our society to refer to things that aren't actually racist and helps cover up things that are racist that shouldn't be covered up. Okay, rant out of the way. Why was, why was racism a factor here? Well, the Austrians and the Habsburgs really did not like the Slavic nations at all. 
We would see this again throughout uh, Germany as well, and we'll see it up until World War I. This was a big part of World War I. We have really what we'd call the Slavic issue, which some people in World War I might have called it that. Which is not an issue. The issue was that you didn't like Slavs, but okay. Anyway, um, that was their issue was that they didn't really like Slavs. And it goes all the way back here. They didn't really like them. So a lot of this has to probably deal with the fact that the Habsburgs had a grudge against anyone like a Czech gunsmith. And if they're going to adopt a gun, it's going to need to be from somebody who's Austrian. I don't know, maybe, maybe like somebody named Werndl, for instance, if you've ever heard of that one. We're not going to be talking about Werndl today, but that's really who they ended up going with. But it was a lot later than this. It was about 10 years after this particular gun. An Austrian, though. Sylvester Kirk is an ethnic Czech. Well, that's, that ain't no good, right? We got to have some national pride here, right? We can't have one of these Slavic guys come up with a gun for us. That was probably the mindset here. And that might be the sole best explanation for why not only this was rejected, but this was rejected so quickly. Because folks, this was genius in 1856. Okay, again, 1856, this is an important year. Remember I said Tsar Nicholas is no longer with us? Well, he gets replaced. And whenever the Tsar gets replaced, this is sort of a big deal because he has absolute authority. He gets replaced by this guy. This is one of the most important men in Russian history. This is Tsar Alexander II. He's known as the great reformer Tsar. So at this point, Russia is a laughingstock of the world. Before the Crimean War, they're looked on as the most powerful nation on earth as far as a military perspective. Now they're just down. They're, not even, they're just all the way down. Like it, it goes a lot further than I can reach if they're so far down. That's a problem, folks. So Russia is, their reputation has been badly tarnished. But what's more important than reputation? People's lives. As a result of the Crimean War, Russia lost about half a million men dead at no gain to them. Just for no reason. If you look at the outcome of the Crimean War, there's no reason. They lost a half a million men died. For what? Some stupid dispute over who has protectorate over in the Holy Land. It's not right, man. Playing games with people's lives. But we see that over and over throughout history. And those half a million men go really have been lost throughout history and just unappreciated. Well, we appreciate their sacrifice because while from a historical standpoint, they died in vain... We have to understand that they didn't because what we have to do is look at the horrible factors that caused their death and understand that that helped drive some change. Okay? It was never enough change, but it did drive change to where we are today. So they, their sacrifice directly impacted history. So their sacrifice is extremely important. Now, Tsar Alexander II was tasked with a lot of problems. Uh, the military was in shambles. You have, a, you have a country that's totally enslaved. Your people are enslaved. Your country is a laughingstock. Um, so now what do we do? Well, that's a bit of a problem, isn't it? Um, there's a lot of directions you could go, but one might be uh, freeing the slaves, for instance. Another might be totally reforming your military. There's a lot of work here to do, folks. A lot. And in parallel to this, one of the really, we're going to see beneficial things is that actually Emmanuel Nobel leaves and returns back to Stockholm. Now, you might say, well, that's contradictory because he set up that factory and that was really good. That started getting Russia in the right direction, but now he's gone. We're going to see why this is important, though. In 1861, this is one of the most important years in Russian history. Alexander II declares that all of the serfs are free. Now, when we say serfs, really they're slaves, right? Up in this point, I refer to them as slaves. You'll hear them referred to as serfs as well. It's really the same thing. They're property. They're enslaved. Well, he frees them overnight. 
And this fixed everything, and there was unicorns and pixie dust flying across Russia. No. No. And in fact, this actually made things a lot worse. Why is that? Well, now you have all these people who were previously taken care of by the landowners. At this point, now the landowners, they're not their property anymore. They're not their problem anymore. So now these people have to take care of themselves. They're given land, they're given land grants, which is good, but they have no education. Oftentimes the land grants weren't big enough to actually be able to support themselves from like subsistence farming. So if you have some land, but it's not even enough to live off of, that's a problem. One of the other problems here is that um, they weren't really just given land by the government. They were given it, but they had to pay a loan. They said, okay, you're a slave, now you're free, but you also now have to pay off the land we're giving you. And the loan time span seems to vary based off of sources that I've read, but it seems to be around 40 years would be the term of the loan. You'd have to pay it off over 40 years. Now, that's a bit of a problem because, remember earlier, we stated that the average life expectancy in Russia is 30 years. So imagine someone tells you, you're free, and by the way, now you have to pay off a 40-year loan for this land. And it's probably not even enough for you to live off of. That wouldn't be good, but it gets worse over time because, think about it, you're going to start having kids, and your kids are going to start having kids, and where do they get land? Well, they have no, they have no education, they can't read or write, so they're going to do the same thing you do, which is farm. Okay, well, you can see this is going to be a problem because you have more people, but you don't get any more land grants for those people. So as you get more relatives and descendants, you have to start splitting up the land grant. So by the time we would get to like World War I, you would have just people splitting up land grants that were so small, it could literally be like the size of this room, like half the size of this room, like just comical. Like why, like why are we even doing this? This, this is pointless. That's how crazy and messed up this system was. And you gotta give them some slack because there's really no good way to do this, unfortunately. When you left with a problem for this long that's compounded for this long, uh, sometimes you just gotta rip off the Band-Aid, folks. <sighs> but could things have been better? Absolutely, things could have been done better. This was a tough time to be alive, but a lot of people were mad because they were emancipated and things still got worse. <sighs> okay. So in 1861, we have this guy. This is a really important guy, Dmitry Milyutin. Now, Milyutin is a really important guy because he was tasked with reforming the peasant army, the decrepit Russian army in early 1860s. How do you do that? Well, they don't have any training. Uh, they have no morale. They don't want to be there. Um, they have no good equipment. There's no good educational systems. There's a lot of work to do. This guy has his work cut out for him, folks. But we're going to see he's going to be important. Okay, now remember, Emmanuel Nobel had left prior in the late 1850s, but remember his son Ludwig, to emphasize the V, we have here V, Ludwig. That's probably how you say his name. And he decides to lease a factory in St. Petersburg from an Englishman. Now, this is important because, as we're going to see, it's going to keep compounding and getting bigger because this is a businessman. He says, right, we got to start somewhere, but we're going to keep growing and we got to improve our uh, business and our output and our quality. But look at what he did here. He bought a factory with some manufacturing of pig iron, bronze, uh, castings for heating pipes. Hmm. That's really interesting, especially in this time in Russia, because again, even in the 1860s, there's really not much industry in Russia. It's mostly subsistence farming. So this is a big deal in Russia in 1862. I can't emphasize that enough. 
One of the other cool things is that they reinvented the wheel, sort of. They actually invented this new hub. It was a hermetically sealed hub that would prevent all sorts of junk for getting inside of it, and it was internally lubricated. So you didn't have to worry about constantly lubricating it, and it would have actual tires and steel spokes. Now, why would you need this in Russia? Well, that's because they have this thing called the Rasputitsa in Russia. And this is basically the rainy season, so you get this in the spring and the fall. And you might notice this picture is not taken in 1862. This is actually uh, the, the Fuhrer's army getting stuck in the Rasputitsa. Some guy in Germany in 1941 thought it was a good idea to invade Russia with horrible supply chain issues and really no good way to resupply yourself once you actually get out there. And the roads look like this. That's right, the Fuhrer thought that was a good idea. Okay, well, they had that problem in World War II, but that was still a problem in 1860s as well. And you might have even seen problems in the Ukraine where Russian tanks get stuck in the mud. Same thing, the Rasputitsa. It ain't no good, folks. So. The Nobel's wheel was really a thing to behold, and I just remember for Russia, where there's really no good industry, pretty incredible. Okay, now in 1867, you might have heard of this, Alexander II makes an interesting decision. He decides to sell Alaska to the United States, and the reason for this is actually a little bit baffling to some, but... It's actually because he looked at the Crimean War outcome and understood how formidable the, the British Navy was. He was concerned about being able to defend Alaska from the British Navy in the 1860s. Think about that. I'm going to say that again. Alexander II was concerned about being able to defend Russian territory in Alaska from the British Navy in the 1860s. <laughs> That's pretty crazy, folks. But this, this makes sense if that actually is a legitimate threat because let's say there's t imminent territory you know that probably you're going to have taken from you and you're not going to get any monetary compensation for it. Someone's just going to come and say, oh, it's mine. Well, if you sell it before that happens, you at least get the money and then you don't have to worry about it. It's SEP, somebody else's problem. Now, it was our problem. And in America... A lot of people made fun of, uh, you know, everything going on. Actually, in 1867, it was sold to Andrew Johnson. And this is funny because Andrew Johnson was really probably one of the worst presidents in American history. But at least this happened under him. Buying Alaska was a pretty smart thing to do. So this might have been the best thing to happen. I mean, this was almost certainly one of the best things to happen under Alex, uh, Andrew Johnson's regime. I almost got like three different people mixed up. <laughs> History is complicated. All right. And they sold it for $7.2 million, which doesn't sound like a lot. And quite frankly, it really wasn't. But it's better than getting nothing especially if the British is going to come take it from you. So this, it's interesting to put some of these events in perspective with some of our history we're more familiar with here in America. Okay, we fast forward now to 1867, where we get Sylvester Kirk's Madman Czech third design super weapon of doom, sort of. This looks a lot better than what we've seen before, and this looks a lot closer to what we're looking at today. <sighs> okay, what we have here are the schematics for a breech-loading conversion for a percussion musket. And here we have our receiver, here we have our locking assembly, and here we have our hammer. Now, we made some subtle improvements, but this is basically the same design. One of the big changes here is now we're no longer using a pin fire cartridge, we're using a really good center fire metallic cartridge, among other things. But there's some minor changes, but this is actually pretty similar to his second design, but he really tinkered and tweaked for a while. I mean, he had almost 10 years to really, to really figure out the ins and outs and the quirks of how do we make this the 
the best possible design for this type and most likely to be adopted by somebody. This guy didn't give up, folks. He's already been rejected numerous times, and he's still going. Way to go, Sylvester. Okay, so here we have our rifle today. This is actually a blown up picture of this rifle. So I think now, since we've finally gotten to this rifle today, let's take a little bit of a closer look at exactly how the internals of this weapon work, because it's really simple, but I want you to get a little bit better of a closer look at it so you can understand exactly what it is we're talking about and how this really ingenious system works. Alas, we finally have a chance to take a closer look at the Kurka. So the first thing we're going to do is check to make sure the rifle's clear. Now to do that on a Kurka, the first thing you do is pull the hammer back. Now one interesting thing to note on this one, there's no half cock. And <laughs> the, the spring in here may be very old, but it's very heavy. This is a man's gun. Ooh, oh, very big positive click back. Whew, this is not for the faint of heart, folks. For being so old, I'm amazed how tough this spring is. Okay, so all we've done is we pulled the hammer back, so it is now cocked, and if I was to pull the trigger, it would obviously lower the hammer and hit the striker here. It is really not much going on here. We have this bronze receiver bat here, and then we have the, this I guess we could call it a trap door, a, a falling lock. I'm not sure how you want to describe this, but we're going to call it a door for this section. So we're going to flip open the door from right to left like that. And that's it, folks. This is very simple. Now, you might have seen when I did that, this little guy here pop out right here. Let me get my trusty toothpick to point here, right here. Let me do that again. See that guy pop out right there? That is actually the extractor slash ejector, okay? So the rim of the cartridge is going to sit right here behind this. And then when I, when I open this, this is going to pop out, push out on the rim, and that's going to extract it. If I really slam this hard, it's going to also act as a pseudo ejector and hopefully kick it out a little bit enough where if it doesn't throw it out, I can at least pull it out with my finger. Now, how does that actually work? This is really, really ingenious, and this is probably the stuff Sylvester Kirka uh, stayed up very late night thinking about how to make and how to make well. It's this guy right here. So if I turn the rifle over, you'll see there's a screw here on the bottom. And what it's doing here is it's uh, affixing this ejector slash extractor assembly. So it's just one long piece of steel, essentially. And it runs through here behind this door, up through here. And you'll, you'll see that it has it's at an angle right here. And that's because when I open this door, it's going to hit here. It's going to hit it, and then it's going to kick it open like that. See that? See it move there? Very, very simple design. Now, one of the drawbacks to this, obviously, this is not going to be the... Of all the methods you could come up with for, let's say, creating an ejector... This is not going to be the strongest, and this was probably one of the biggest weak spots of this rifle. Uh, I guess at least amongst the hands of the, those that used it was, eh, you know, it's not going to send out, it's not going to eject like a Mosin would, right? Where, you know, a Mosin, you eject it, you pull that bolt back, and it's going to send that case flying out into the next county. This guy, not really the same thing, right? So instead of, like, pulling getting all that leverage and force accumulated by pulling that bolt out with your hand, right? You can you can pull that rascal out really fast. This one you don't it's not super long, so you don't get a ton of leverage and um, it's hard to get it going real fast. Archimedes probably wouldn't be a huge fan of this system, but still, I mean it it obviously works and we have to balance 
The drawbacks are the fact that this is really simple. I mean, how are you going to break this? This is just one piece of steel held in with a screw. I love it. Okay, it's not the greatest system, but it works. Okay, it does work. This would not have been adopted by the Russian army in droves if it didn't work. And as we'll see more in our story today, this one definitely was adopted by the Russian army. Um, we'll get to the markings here in a little bit. Now, the other thing we need to talk about is the striker assembly, right? And so it's kind of built into the lock, the, the, the door here, right? So we have this whole door, but built in, we have this thing. See that? So I can push this in. It's spring-loaded. And you'll notice um, on this side, look at that. There is a tiny little firing pin. So this is actually really simple and very cool. And now one thing you might notice is that this striker, as we're going to call it, this piece here, is actually currently installed upside down on the rifle. Uh, now there's a couple theories as to why that is, but um, what I'm actually going to do now is take this out so you can actually get a better view of it and see how simple this whole mechanism is. So... What I'm going to do is get my trusty Wheeler screwdriver with a properly sized bit. And all I'm going to do is just unscrew this screw like this. And you might wonder, is Big Big Sam, is something going to go flying out of the gun when you do that? Well, obviously, as you can see, uh, that is not the case, and I'll show you why that is not the case. Okay, so there's our screw. We can see this whole section isn't even threaded. It's just the top that's threaded here. Pretty simple. All right. Now, when you see when I open this, it, it'll pop out a little bit, but now I can just pull out this whole assembly here. Now, how many people have even living have even seen the internals of a Kirkus Striker assembly, probably not enough. We can see this is his design, and it's really ingenious. In fact, this is pretty funny. Uh, totally unrelated, but what this looks like up here is the head of a gas piston off of an AK-47 rifle, which, of course, is also Russian. That's a kind of a strange coincidence, but it's something you can probably appreciate if you like that platform. Maybe this is where Kalashnikov got that idea from. He was playing around with a Kernka striker assembly. We'll never know. But anyway, we can see here that we have this hole going through here, and that's what that screw is, a, that cross screw is going through there, and that screw is acting as a retention mechanism. Okay. So, wh Where's the spring, right? We were like, okay, well, we pulled that out, and we know there was spring tension, but we pulled this guy out, took the screw out, and there's no spring. Well, um, it's kind of hard to show you on camera, but you have to take my word for it. If there's a, basically a, a captive spring inside here, also holding in the, the firing pin. Um, it's just like one, it's basically one unit, the firing pin assembly in here, and it's just being held in with that spring, but it's all captive, essentially. Um, but this is really all you should need to do for maintenance unless you have a firing pin or firing pin spring issue, which is not super likely. Uh, but again, it's pretty simple. And we can see this guy is completely numbers mismatching. The only numbers that match on this rifle are going to be this number here on the receiver, the 71226. You will also see that number here on this side of the barrel right here, 71226. Uh, everything else seems to be mismatched. And this brings up another interesting question that you might have is, okay, well, you know, this is kind of early days uh, in Russia and getting breech loading cartridges set up. Uh, are the parts interchangeable on Kirka rifles? Uh <laughs> Well, that's a really good question. And this, the short answer is no, but it, it, no asterisk, right? But here's the thing. They can't really do interchangeable parts at this point in time. 
so we're still really in the in the era of like handmade uh, muzzle loading rifles. So it's sort of a tall order to tell your factories to build these rifles in the hundreds of thousands with these set like parts and components. And remember, you gotta get you gotta get these right enough because these these have to headspace properly, and there's all these other factors that go into play. So this was a tall ask, and this is probably one of the reasons the Russians liked this design because eh, the tolerances are can be loose enough to where you don't necessarily even need interchangeable parts to interchange parts. And we can see here, somebody, this was not Big Sam, did a little bit of grinding, looks like, or filing right here, maybe to make this work. I don't know. Um, <laughs> now, this, this is acceptable because uh, you can't really get spare parts for Kurnkas anywhere. So if somebody had to do something minor to make it work, it it happens. I'm just really glad we have this example to look at today, folks, because I don't think I could get another one of these for the show if I wanted to. Uh, we can see here the number on this guy doesn't match. This is 5489, and I don't see any maker's marks on really any of these parts. But what we can go ahead and do, and I can show you this is interesting, um... Because this is two-sided, I can actually install the striker upside down, as I showed you, or right side up. And maybe this was another interesting solution, because if we look, take a closer look at this striker here, we can see this guy is really worn from use. And if you look at pictures, all the pictures I managed to find of Kirkus, I haven't actually really found one with a striker that's all worn out like this. So either this wasn't heat-treated super well, or... This thing has just been used a lot. Um, potentially both are, are correct for this particular rifle. We can see this guy doesn't match either. This serial number is 632... I believe that's 255. So upside down, you can see the little wear marking where we're hitting it upside down. It's supposed to hit here. So if the geometry... Because this is where it gets weird... If the hammer geometry isn't right, you might run into issues, which I suspect may be the problem on this one. But it seems to work fine if it's upside down. So is that an intentional design of Kernka or an unintentional consequence? Is that a bug or a feature? Yes. All I know is that it works. In fact, the previous owner of this rifle uh, actually claimed that he shot this. He did hand load, and I actually saw a picture of him shoot and you should see the fire and brimstone that comes out of these rifles oh it is it is it impressive but any man who hand loads 15.24 by 40 rimmed kernka is a friend of mine but i'm not gonna do that because i'm not man enough to do that um so we're gonna go ahead and uninstall uh, un uh install this excuse me and we'll go ahead and put it in uh backwards because it seems to work better that way and so you'll notice here, okay, we're interfacing that spring again. All you have to do to install this is to just sort of put them in like that. And I can close this because it'll kind of hold it in place. The geometry of the receiver will. Um, maybe. Or actually, I can probably just hold it like... It's kind of hard to... I'm not even looking at the camera because it's kind of hard to do all this, so... Uh, yeah, that makes sure that's lined up. And uh, it's threaded on this back side. This hole here is not threaded. Okay, so now I'm just take my screwdriver like this. Just get it started. Nice and easy, folks. Nice and easy. Don't need to do anything crazy. This is an old gun that has been places. All right, that's it. We are El Dunno. See? Very simple. And our firing pin still works. Okay. Uh, and if we wanted to, we could also take out our... Uh, I guess what, 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 what did I refer to this as? The door here? Um, by simply pulling out this screw here on the back, you can see this is a big screw here on the back. I just pull that out, and then I can take this whole assembly off if I wanted to. 
And this is really cool because let's say I break a firing pin and I need to do like a quick replacement and maybe I'm like a field armorer. If I have a bunch of these laying around, even if they're not necessarily 100% interchangeable, all I do is pull one screw out, take this guy out, drop in a new one, put in the screw, and just check headspace. And if everything works fine, I'm good to go. And if it doesn't work, just drop in another one and keep doing it until it works. That may have been something they did because, honestly, it's one screw for this whole assembly, and then you don't have to deal with that captive spring in there or anything genius design like this is amazingly simple and you know i've always heard that in designs it's really easy to make something complicated that works but it's really hard to make something like beautifully simple that works and it's it's so true if you ever actually try to go design something it's it could be really hard to make something really simple the more you try to simplify things generally that's when you really start running into issues and it's like okay well i fixed one thing and now I've created two more issues and I have to go fix them and each one of those created two more issues. It's ugh. That's probably why it took Kernka so long and he was working so long on this design and this was the fruit. Amazing. Okay, so we can kind of see how this works. Again, this should be this whole same locking assembly as a Russian percussion uh, percussion musket did. Interestingly enough, I would expect to see some sort of half-cock mechanism on these. I don't know if the Russian muskets didn't have them or what. This guy has no half-cock. So remember, this guy, you really got to hold this tight if you're going to let the hammer down. This, this is a tough spring. Oof. All right. We are safe. And we made sure that there's no live ammunition in there. So that's good. That's basically the Kirka. That's how it works. It's an gun, and an gun is very simple. There's not a lot of moving parts here, folks. And that is a beautiful thing if you have factories that have to produce this by the hundreds of thousands. Okay, now we can take a look at our sights here. Now, the sights are interesting because this is a really crude system, but it actually works, and it seems to work fairly well for what it is. So you'll notice there's two notches here. Um, one is going to be your volley notch. One is going to be your standard notch. And then we have this little twist knob here. So this is what actually sets the sight. Now, what you're supposed to have on these is graduations here on the left side. This one is so worn, there's really nothing left. So you should have graduations here. And it would have been in arshins, which would have been the unit of measurement at the time in Imperial Russia. Uh, but again, we don't have any of that luxuries. Uh, we just sort of have to guess it and use some Kentucky windage, and I guess Kentucky elevation. I don't know if that's a word. You folks in Kentucky will have to let me know. But if I want to adjust the sight, I just remember righty-tighty, lefty-loosey. I just open up this twist knob, okay? And we can see there's this little piece here on the side, which is what secures it here, okay? So now this guy just freely moves up and down. Very simple. Now, some Kernkas, you'll have a much longer front sight. I've heard stories that that's, that's the target front sights. And that the, like, this, the non-sharpshooter, like, just, you know, Joe Schmo enlisted guy would have had a sight like this. I don't really know. But you will see some different sights. And that kind of makes sense, though, because that seems to be a more precision sight. And I think you had a little bit more uh, room for uh, sight adjustment there as well for, for range. But you can just adjust it to where you want to. So you'd have graduations, line it up with the graduation you want, and then just tighten it like that. See? All right. So we're going to tighten this guy back up. And that's, again, that's about... It on the site, it's very simple, and we have a very simple uh, post up here as well. If I can show you that for a front sight, wow, this gun is long, folks. There we go. See, front sight is heh, very simple, but thankfully, this one still has a front sight, it's not completely all worn down. Oh, get this guy back here. Oh, all right. This is a kind of a big gun. Now, before we look more into the markings, speaking of the size, 
I have a scale here, and we're actually going to go ahead and weigh this rifle, because I've never weighed this. So you'll learn with me exactly what this behemoth weighs. I will say it balances very, very nicely, though. The balance point is pretty far back. It's, like, right around here, uh, or pretty close. It's, like, I don't know how, because it's a bronze receiver, and it's got to be something with a stock at the back, because... You have such a long barrel, I don't know how the balance point is so good on this thing. But it is, so we will take it. Now, I'm going to get my scale here. Got our rifle on the scale, folks. And it is 4.3 kilograms. And for folks in America, that is 9 pounds, about 9.5 ounces. So not quite 10 pounds. Eh! That's actually not as bad as I was expecting it to be. Very interesting. So now we know what, what a Kunker rifle weighs. See, this is really valuable information, folks. I don't know what you would do without this information. Okay, so now that we know what a Kunker weighs, I'm going to go ahead and get this guy off the scale. Move back here. Let me turn him off. Negative zero ounces. Okay. Here we go. All right, bring it back on the table. And now we're going to look at some of the markings on this guy, because I know y'all are probably interested in that as well. Okay, so starting here, you've probably seen these markings. What exactly do we have here? Well, what we have here, and let me make sure my camera is going to zoom in. Right? Maybe I can even zoom in a little bit more. Okay. And my pointer, which is right here. Okay, this is I, which stands for Izhevsk. This is Aruzhny, which is weapons. This is Zavat, which is factory. So this is Izhevsk Weapons Factory, 1870. So we know that this is probably a newly produced rifle, not a conversion. We'll talk about that more here in a little bit. But they weren't really making muskets in 1870. <laughs> so that's a pretty good indicator of... A, that this was a newly produced rifle. Now, as we're going to see, this does beg the question, is it just the stock that was produced by Izhevsk, or was the barrel and the receiver separately? We don't necessarily know. But if we flip him over here, this is where it gets cool, because now you're going to see something you may be a little bit more familiar with. See this bow and arrow right here? That's an Izhevsk factory logo, and... You might have even seen this on a Mosin, maybe even one you own on some of the components. I remember my first 9130 rifle I ever got, was made in 1942, had this marking on the bolt. It had an older bolt handle, same one we see here on the Kernka. That's pretty cool. And if I move this guy up, it's faint, but we see the same marking here on the bottom as well. And now this brings us to another good point and an interesting segue. You might have noticed this guy here, this little uh, little protrusion sticking out. Well, this is supposed to be sort of a bit of a, like a finger rest, okay? The idea is you don't have a pistol grip in the stock, but this is to give you a little bit more support to sort of simulate a pistol grip in the stock. And it actually... It, it kind of works. It's it's not super long, but it's long enough to where you can actually get a decent purchase and put some force back on it with your finger as you're holding on to the rifle. So I really like this. And this isn't specific to, like, Sylvester Kernka, per se, because we see this was actually used on the muskets, the Russian muskets, before the Kernka was even adopted. So they just sort of carried over with this. This is where it gets into an interesting gray area. Is like, well, how much of this was actually Sylvester Kernka's design versus, like, carryover from older Russian designs? Mm, it's kind of a hybrid, as we've seen so far. Okay, well, let's go to the receiver now. Remember, we saw our serial number here. Now we see all these weird markings, like, really weird markings. Okay, so we see this circle marking with... I don't know, maybe like a flower or something. This looks like some Cyrillic letters here. See more up here. 
And then we see right here our proof commission logo. This is good. This is something we've actually seen on M91 Mosin-Nagant rifles. So this is familiar territory. But there's no Ijev's factory logo up here. There's no Tula factory logo. There's no nothing. And we see up here, we got nothing. I don't see anything here. And if we turn it over, we see a one? I don't, I don't know what that is. Uh, but not a whole lot to go off of there. When we try to start decoding the uh, symbols on the Kerker receivers, this folks gets into a weird rabbit hole. Because as we're going to see, a lot of different people helped produce these rifles. So we may never know what some of these markings mean, but it also seems like the Ijevs factory, I haven't seen an example where the Ijevs factory bow and arrow are actually on the receiver. So it's really hard to say if this whole part was actually assembled and is to, and is correct to this gun as the, the stock is. But remember, one, one thing we can probably infer is the serial number. And we'll see this later, but it seems like the percussion muskets that were converted to the Kirka pattern, like this guy, will have two serial numbers. One serial number for the original configuration that it was originally given, and then a new serial number for the new Kernka designation, so two serial numbers. The ATF would not like that, folks. David Chipman would not be amused by that. But since this guy only has one serial number, it, it maybe lends to the credence of this, that it was a newly produced rifle. I don't know. There's not a lot of markings, and the barrels, there's, it's so worn. I mean, you can barely see that serial number. It is so worn, folks, uh, that, uh, well, we take what we can get. One interesting thing to note here, it can be hard to see, there's a Sistarets factory arrow on the site. So this rear sight was actually produced by the Sistarets factory. See that right there? Get in the light good. Yeah, so that's cool. And it seems like this is a pretty easy component to swap out, so... If you have to, not a big deal. That's pretty handy. Uh, as far as markings go, that's about it. Um, oh, there is one other Ijev's marking on the stock. Let me bring this guy back up here to show you. Uh, right at the end, the stock end cap. There's another Ijev's bow and arrow. That is beautiful, folks. Really cool to see these cool original Russian components on this rifle. Now, we'll talk more about exactly how this rifle came in to be here, but where did this particular rifle come from? Because, again, these guns are like hen's teeth. Uh, this one has an interesting story. Apparently, this rifle was imported from Bulgaria in 2014. And that kind of makes sense because, as we'll see in our later episodes from the uh, during and after the Russo-Turkish War of 1877, Russia actually gave some of these to Bulgaria, and even by the time World War I came around, Bulgaria had, well, the documentation is sketchy, but the number I've seen is roughly like 14,000 of these rifles by World War I. So, even by World War I, they didn't really have any. So the fact that they, that they had such a small amount, and the fact that the only way we could even get one of these was from Bulgaria. It gives you a good indicator of how many rifles of these there are still in existence, especially in Russia. There really aren't that many, folks. So this is definitely a special gun to behold. Oh, look at that. There's another Ijev's factory marking right there on the other side. This, like, reinforcement lug in the stock. There it is right there. And we have our typical sling swivel on the trigger guard, just like our carryovers from our older muskets. That's not so much a Sylvester Kernka thing. Remember, he he probably doesn't care so much about some of the aesthetics or ergonomics as he does the actual functional parts, because this can be changed relatively easily. But messing with anything up in here, that's where things get really important and potentially really tricky, and that's where you want to get it right. So this is really up here what he cared about, and the internal workings. Um, but it was cool, remember, this is not really a Sylvester Kernka hammer per se. 
This little protrusion here is actually an adaptation from Sylvester Kernka onto this hammer, which would have existed probably on a standard percussion musket. And again, as we're going to see, we talk more about this rifle and the Russian use. They actually reused the hammers from, at least on the conversions, from the existing musket. They just could adapt it. So pretty cool. The other weird thing about this that I want to mention is it actually goes, the striker isn't per, like totally perpendicular. It actually goes in a bit of an angle like that. See that? Kind of hard to see on camera, but that's just the way the geometry is Sylvester Kirk could design this. Really interesting, <laughs> uh, but it works and it works pretty well. So that's really about all there is to it, folks. I mean, we spent half an hour looking at this because I really want to look at just every single detail because these guns are really hard to get a good look at, so I want to give as much detail and closer look as possible. But again, this is really, really simple stuff, but it's, it's, not some, it's so simple that it would be really hard to come up with. That's why it's so ingenious. All right. So now that we've taken a closer look at our gun today and we have a better understanding of what it is we're dealing with here with Sylvester Kernka's third design and its application in the Russian use, uh, let's see how this gun actually ends up in the hands of Russia now. All right, so now that we've had a chance to take a little bit of a closer look at exactly how Sylvester Kernka's genius and simplistic system actually works. And we know what his third design kind of looks like now. Let's see where he went with this. Because right now, up until now, right, we've only had rejection after rejection, right? It's sort of like the story of Big Sam's dating life. Well, he didn't give up. So, <clears throat> What happens next is in 1867, Sylvester Kernka decides to take, and he got permission to take his rifle from Vienna to St. Petersburg. That's right, he's on the horizon for another contract, but this time he's not looking exactly in his own country, in Austria, he's looking out towards Russia. It was an interesting idea. And one of the things he's learned by now is that, number one, in order to be successful, you have to have a really fashionable hat. And I think he's even got some sort of turkey feather or something in there. That, with a bow tie, fashion was top notch, sir. Very good. But he also figured out, I have a genius design, but it hasn't gotten anywhere. It's not necessarily what you know, it's who you know. And I know a lot of inventors out there will probably understand what it is I'm talking about. You can have a great design, but if you don't have the right connections, it's just not going to go anywhere. It'll be not even be worth your time. So he meets up with this guy named Baron Theodore von Hahn, who is Colonel of the Honorary Guard of the Hulan Regiment. I think that's Ulan Regiment. The problem is a lot of these words were are like Russian words that were translated from Czech into English. <laughs> so some of the characters might be a little bit off. And in particular, I've had trouble figuring out if it's Baron von Hahn or Baron von Gahn. And the reason is because his name, that H-A-H-N, uh, was actually translated from Russian with the Cyrillic character G-A-N. But the problem in Russian, when you're translating from Russian to English in a word that starts with G, this is kind of weird, but translated to English, you kind of have a hard time figuring out if that word was supposed to say ga, or if it was supposed to be silent and say ha. So some translations you'll see han, and throughout this presentation you might even see von gan. This interesting problem with translating and pronunciation of G to English, we're actually going to see that again in episode two. You'll see that again. But this guy was an important part of the Russian army. He was an important connection. So Sylvester Kirk is starting to figure out, okay, we're going to make, uh, 
We're going to try to make it big in somewhere else because we've been rejected here thus far. And we're going to try to start making these important connections high up in the military. Hmm. He was a smart guy and he was tenacious. Unfortunately, it didn't really pan out for him. You see, they actually quite liked his design. Unfortunately, it really came down to a problem of ammunition. You see, his design was so advanced that it called for these really fancy metallic cartridges. Remember in Russia, they did go through a process of converting in the 1850s of converting and producing some new percussion muskets, right? So we went and flint, we started with flintlock and at least we got to percussion. That's what they have today. A lot of percussion muskets. There's probably a lot of flintlocks still around, but percussion muskets really what the current technology is in Russia. So when you look at that subsistence society and yeah, there's not a lot of industry, how are you gonna make the brass cartridges? You have to draw out the brass and you gotta make, have these big factories to produce millions of these rounds. They, they had no way to do it, unfortunately. And that's really where in lies the problem in 1867 for Sylvester Kernko with the Russian contract. Didn't really come to fruition. They said, we really like your gun. We just can't get the ammunition for this. <sighs> okay, so that's another rejection, but we're closer. They liked his gun and they didn't say no they said no because, and this is something he didn't really get from the Austrians. They didn't really say no because, you know, this or that or the other. It was mainly just no, is not viable. Okay, so at least we have like a really well-defined reason why the Russians couldn't adopt this. I think they wanted to adopt this. They liked this, but they just couldn't because how are you going to make the ammunition for it? Kind of a problem. But just hypothetically, let's look at something else they were producing. Now, the Russians were also looking around at this gun called the Baranov rifle. Now, we're not going to really talk about it here in this series as much. They adopted it in a pretty small numbers, but this was something that they were looking at in comparison to the Kurnga when we're talking about mass-wide adoption, like hundreds of thousands of rifles for your, the entire Russian army which is big, folks. Okay, the Baranov is kind of the simple, uh, the similar concept where you take one of the existing Russian percussion muskets, you make some modifications at the back to allow it to accept uh, metallic cartridges. Except this time, this one is weird. It's like a breech loader from the top. It's got this little breech that opens I'll give you all a hint. You'll see that again in the next episode. Pretty strange and very different than the Kernka system. This one looks a little bit more complex. And in fact, it is because we can see there's a big price difference here. It's six rubles back then to do a Kernka conversion. But to convert to the Baranov pattern, it's seven rubles, 50 kopecks. Mm. Now that may not seem like a big difference, but if you multiply that by half a million rifles, that's a substantial difference. So already they were looking at that, but now they're looking at the Kernka and they're saying, you know what, this is a lot cheaper and this is probably what we need, but can we do it right now? Mm, no, but the Kernka is really winning out here in Russia, folks, as far as a rifle design, it's top notch. So again, it had a simplicity that the Baranov didn't really have. Like the Baranov was more like a really nice, like Belgian pattern conversion, very high quality, but it was expensive and it was gonna be a lot slower to, to, uh, to make. Um, the Kurka was a little bit simpler and it was more suited to being able to adapt to existing guns easier. And that's good. That's what Sylvester Kirk was going for. That's been the whole point since 1849 of, okay, let's take what you got and bring it up to the modern age. You don't have to go make all these fancy new rifles. It doesn't have to be expensive. That's really what the Russians like. That's exactly what they need because that's really all they could do. All right. And the slide housing here, which is going to be this breech mechanism that opens to the left here, the cool thing was they could actually forge that 
And the final product, just from the foraging, was actually really close to the actual dimensions. Like they didn't have to do a lot of final machining and making it look nice. That's good. Simpler, cheaper, quicker, that's what they need. So this is looking a lot better than the Baranov system. Now, again, the other thing is the striker here. The striker is a lot simpler and it's gonna be easier overall to adapt to this uh, architecture than the Baranov. <sighs> It's hard to see where the Baranov's winning. I mean, it's, it, it, might be, it might be overall a more robust system, but how would we define robust, higher quality? Maybe, but is that what the Russians need? Is that what they're looking for? No, okay, and why is that? Well, they, <laughs> the Russian economy is really bad at this time. Um, when they freed the serfs, it went from bad, because remember, post, uh, Crimean War, it got really bad. And then they freed the serfs and then actually got worse because the landowner's productivity went because they didn't have anybody to work the land anymore. And a lot of the land was given now to the peasants and they're having a hard time just staying afloat. So the economy is doing really bad. So <laughs> you don't want to have to spend tons of unnecessary money adapting your... <laughs> in a lot of cases already worn out rifles to a really nice new spec, right? It's gotta be cost effective. We're gonna see a lot of this mindset again, folks, when we get to our Mosin, this idea of simplicity and cost effectiveness, right? Well, kind of started here with the Kernka. Okay, now another huge thing happens in 1867. This is a big year, folks. Russia emancipates the weapons factories. And you might be going, what? Yeah, the weapons factories were really messed up, just like the rest of the country was. All of the workers were basically enslaved. They were, how would we put this? Forced labor, essentially. So the thing was, in 1867, well, that's six years on from Russia freeing the serfs. The thing is, Russia was afraid to go ahead and immediately free the factories because they're like, well, we still have to produce weapons. <laughs> like if we free the factories and then no one's gonna be around to produce weapons anymore, mm, that's gonna be a bit of a problem. So they had to wait, they had to get a plan together. And in 1867, they finally emancipated the factories. Now, the factories would go a little bit different. Now, here's a picture of the Tula factory. Now, as far as I can tell, the Tula factory had a good plan in place on, okay, you don't have to stay, you can do whatever you want, you're free, but they wanted, they had a good plan in place to keep the really skilled gunsmiths there. That's important. The problem is uh, the Izhevsk factory, who uh, produced this rifle, as far as we can tell, they didn't really have that. Uh, in fact, it was basically the opposite of that. The Izhevs factory, it was basically they gave incentives to their uh, most experienced gunsmiths to leave, to get out of there, to go do something else. Maybe go work someplace else, start up their own thing, do something. That's really not what you want. And that's really what they didn't want to happen. Um, and unfortunately, we're gonna see that's what did. Now, now, this happened under one Dmitry Semenovich Frolov. This guy, as far as I can tell, was probably not the best fit to run the Izhev's factory because of said problem, where they have all of their competent gunsmiths leaving. Well, who do you replace them with? You replace them with people who, maybe they want to be there at least because at this point, they're not forced to be there, but certainly aren't gonna have like 20 years of skill set. It's gonna be someone, maybe if you're lucky, you'll find a, some apprentice gunsmith from somewhere, but realistically, we're talking about really unskilled people working at this factory. <laughs> it's comical, this is a big problem. Uh, there wasn't really good schooling for these people either, so they just sort of had to learn as they go, I guess. Uh, but poor Dimitri, he, he didn't quite last too long, as we're going to see in our upcoming episodes. Now, in January 15th, it was pretty cool because 
it was actually announced during, during church, I believe, that the Ajevs factory workers were dismissed from mandatory work forever. And I like the way this is phrased because it really hits home how meaningful this was. And you can imagine being forced to work somewhere your whole life uh, and then now saying, oh, you don't have to work there anymore. And remember, child labor was a really big part of the factory as well. So a lot of that, and it seemed like some of that at least ended up going away. Maybe not a good thing. <laughs> This is a really messed up scenario, folks. So this caused a lot of problems because a lot of them ended up leaving and then they realized, well, all I know is gunsmithing, so I don't know what to do now. And if I have to go be a subsistence farmer, well, I don't know how to farm because I'm a gunsmith. <sighs> no schooling, big problem. Okay, also, in eight, we're never going to get past 1867, it feels like, but I promise we will at some point. The Austro-Hungarian Empire is formed. Now, up until then, it was really just the Austrian Empire, but we can see this was one of the biggest empires in all of Europe at this time, and it encompassed all the way from here in the, the Italian Alps, all the way over to Transylvania, modern-day Romania, up into Ukraine, and in Bohemia, and all the way down here into, uh, I guess, modern-day Bosnia, Herzegovina, just... <laughs> Massive country. What was the problem here? Well, number one, if you're the Austrians, you don't really like a lot of other races, especially the Slavs. So why was this a problem? Well, if we look from, a, from an ethnicity perspective of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, it's going to look something like this. Now, here's different colors of different ethnicities. We've got anything from, we got a lot of Germans, obviously, but we've got Hungarians, uh, in the east, you have Czechs up in the northwest, you have Slovaks up in the north, Poles up in the far north, Ukrainians in the northeast, you have Slovenians kind of down here by Italy, modern day Slovenia, imagine that. Um, you have the Croats and the Serbs down in the south, Romanians out in the southeast and the east, and Italians out in the west. So you just look at all of these races and ethnicities. And guess what? They all got along perfectly. Not really, actually. Uh, there were some problems. Now, there were some problems with infighting, but also, how do, you, how do you realistically rule these people if you yourself don't even like them? Well, you rule it with an iron fist. And ultimately, that was sort of the Austro-Hungarians' downfall and demise uh, in the... Uh, ashes of World War I, as we'll see in a future video. But this was really the landscape of Sylvester Kernke, and he was sort of in there, the Czechs, just one of the many, many ethnicities. Now, another thing worth mentioning here is in this time period, if you wanted to be successful in this part of Europe, you had to speak German. If you didn't speak German, you weren't really going to get that far as a proper businessman. And thankfully, Sylvester Kernke learned German, so he was able to really do his best. And this is another reason why it's, it seems like it would boil down to just they didn't like him because he was Czech, the Austrians, because he was very, very well educated. He understood German. He could read and write in the, the appropriate language for the time. And still, nothing, nothing. Didn't give him any respect, which is pretty depressing. Okay, now... What about this, the Serbian contract in 1868? Well, that's right. You see, Sylvester Kernko was looking around in one of the countries. He was interested in getting a contract for his third model rifle was Serbia. Now, he had a sort of a deal hashed out with Prince Mihailo Obranovic III, and I probably butchered that, and I'm sorry. Um, but this guy was a pretty interesting character, and they actually had to test Kernga's weapon, and unfortunately, um, it, he'd got yeeted. This was a really common thing back in the day, to have some sort of royalty in, say, Europe or the Balkan region get yeeted or assassinated. These things happen. So, eh, okay, we had a deal going, it was looking good, and then he gets assassinated. <sighs> Sylvester Kernga can't catch a break. Well, 
Instead, we were before we were dealing under this administration with the Jovan Belimarkovic, who was the Serbian minister of war at the time. But after Prince Mihailo gets yeeted, he actually gets replaced with this guy. Now, take a look at this guy. This is Milivoje Petrovic Blaznovac. That's how we would say that over to, down in Texas. Um, he was the new minister of war. And check out this guy. This guy looks like a killer if I've ever seen one, folks. I wouldn't want to trifle with this guy. He's got a pistol in his sash like a proper Serb would. And overall, just a downright killer, probably. Um, but maybe they all looked like that back in the day. But I wouldn't want to mess with this guy. Anyway, though, it, it was looking good again. Kernka actually had them test his gun at the uh, arsenal, and how do I say that? The Krag, Kragujevac arsenal. For those Serbians out there, I'm sure you'll know how to pronounce that correctly. <laughs> and down in Texas, we don't know how to pronounce words like that, but we do our best. Um, but that was the arsenal that they tested this rifle at, and just the fact that they got to that point was really good. Unfortunately, it seems like the Austrian influence kind of infiltrated its way into this testing because apparently throughout the testing, the Serbians actually tried to self-destruct these guns, have these guns self-destruct on them by maybe walking from, from there's some translation issues, but it seems like when we say increase the closing clearances, we're talking about they increase the headspace by a millimeter. And if they did, that's terrifying. This is a bronze receiver gun, so that's pretty scary. And I could see why they would think that would uh, make the gun fail. Um, and they fired 30 rounds through it and nothing, nothing. This is the, this is, this is, this is the gun, man. This thing is astonishing. I mean, this gun really punches above its weight. If, uh, if it can fire 30 rounds with a out of spec, horribly out of, horribly out of spec headspace, and it works fine with a bronze receiver. So it almost seems like witchcraft how he got this gun to work as well as it did, but it did. Pretty interesting. Okay. So they tried to make the gun fail purposely and it, they couldn't even get it to fail. So, I mean, at that point, how do you say no to this gun, right? I mean, you're Serbia, you're not the richest country in the world, but this is gonna be a pretty good gun for you, obviously. So this is really promising. That arsenal produced, they put this into small scale production. They produce 400 Kernka pattern rifles. And then he gets the contract, except no. Um, the whole thing falls through right at the very end again. <sighs> we snatched defeat from the jaws of victory, folks, yet again. Poor Sylvester Kirk. Now, what happened here? Well, we don't really know exactly. Um, as far as I can tell, it seems like it might have been just an issue with m money and negotiating a price to the point where he wouldn't really been able to make money off of this. And I mean, you got to be a businessman too. You know, if you're not going to make money on something, it's probably not worth your time. You might even lose money. If you're not making money, you're very close to losing money at that point. And, mm. So that's one of the theories as to why, but for whatever reason, it fell through again. He's the unluckiest man in the world, but he doesn't give up, folks. He doesn't give up. He is still going. Sylvester Kernka is like the Czech Energizer Bunny on steroids. So what happens next? Well, we get an interesting visit from Nicola I of Montenegro. Now, this guy is a really important guy because he's the leader of Montenegro. And back in Vienna, Sylvester Kirker was allowed to bring his rifle to a shooting range at the Turkinschanze, which this is the closest picture I could find for the modern day, uh, I guess, representation of where this would have been. It's just like a really wooded area, essentially. That's, that berm is probably not a shooting berm. This is just like a general area. 
this is sort of the area that they had, they were conducting a test of different rifles. And I'm not exactly sure how Sylvester Kernka managed to get his rifle there. It might have been the Austrians sort of said, All right, we have to just let him come because it'll, it'll be so blatant that we just hate him because he's Czech if we don't let him bring his rifle. So we got to at least let him participate. Okay, well, while they were doing that, the Prince of Montenegro comes and he gets to sample Sylvester Kernka's wonderful Czech wonder weapon of doom. And as it turns out, he really liked this gun, if you could believe that. Now, Montenegro has a really rich military history and culture. They're not famous for being weak men. And so they're really interested in something that's cost effective, but very good and very deadly, like a lot of people, um, to arm their small but very proud nation. And he saw this and he said, you know what, I think I'll have that. And so he gets his first contract. All right, so in 1868, after almost 20 years, back since 1849, he's been trying, 19 years, Montenegro orders 5,000 percussion muskets converted to the Kernka breech loading system. This, folks, is finally his break. Now, this is not Kernka's big break, but this is a break. Now, if you have failure upon failure upon failure, when you finally have six, a little bit of success, sometimes that just gives you the spark you need to go do something really big. So, he finds an interesting man by the name of Thomas Sed... I can't... I don't know if it's Sederal or Sederal. Sed Earl. It's a weird name, said Earl. That's, that's how he would use that in Arkansas. Whatever the case, though, a man named Thomas Sederal. And this guy did some interesting things. Now, we don't, know how, we don't know what he looked like. It appears he was Austrian. And I found this picture off of, I think this was the Luger forums, where Thomas Sederal actually developed an auto-ejecting revolver. This would be an Austrian revolver. This is weird. You're like, you've got a separate hammer thing. I don't know. There's a lot of mystery about who this man is and exactly what influence he's, he had. But it seems to be that he invented this gun, or at least had some part in this gun. And this was a really important influence for Sylvester Kernker. Remember going back to that von Hahn slash von Gahn, whatever his name was, in the Russian military. Sylvester Kernka is trying to get more connections, right? He's trying to claw everywhere he can to get a little bit of traction, to get a little bit of favor with somebody, to help him gain favor with somebody higher up, to help him finally gain favor with someone that'll accept his rifle. So Thomas Sederal is an interesting guy, and he's important because, remember going back to Russia, what was the problem? Why didn't they like this gun? Well, they liked it, but they couldn't accepted into military service because of the ammunition. Okay, so this was the big problem. How do we make the ammunition? Well, he got together with Sederal and they formed a contract for producing ammunition. Now, this was a Sylvester Kernka design where you would actually have a drawn brass case with a center fire cartridge, um, a center fire primer. This is really modern. This is... This is very modern for eight, the 18, late 1860s. And Sylvester Kernka says, hey, I got the design. I need you to help me produce it. If you can help me produce it for the Russians, we can go to the Russians and say, hey, you can accept this gun because we are going to help you make the ammunition. And there's going to be money in it for Thomas. There'll be obviously money in it for Kernka because they're going to, they're, he'll, he'll have the contract for the ammunition and as well as the contract for the rifles, which is really the big prize, because it's going to be a lot. Okay, well, remember our, our boy Von Hahn slash Von Gahn? Interestingly enough, this guy himself invented his own type of ammunition. Now, it's this guy right here. This is a little bit different, and I'm quite frankly staggered that this worked. But normally, and this was Sylvester Kirker's design, the way you would make a case is it would, it would be drawn brass. Von Gahn's design for a brass case was 
basically a sheet of brass that you wrap and, and fold, and then you, there's a seam. I, how that didn't fail, I have no idea, but apparently, I don't know, maybe he had like the, the uh, Austro-Hungarian 19th century version of JB Weld to keep that thing together, but he kept it together one way or another. <laughs> I don't know how, but he did. It's a really weird design. I think there's many reasons why we don't really see that design in other places. Uh, remember, this is this is Russia, Russia in the 1860s. If anyone's going to adopt a really primitive cartridge like that, it would be Russia because, well, if it works, it works. And if you can make it, well, then that's something because that's a lot better than a lot of the other cool stuff out there which you just have no way to make today. Okay, so like he did with Thomas Sederl, he has another contract with Baron von Hahn saying, all right, if the Russians adopt this rifle, we're gonna have a contract to produce the ammunition for them. So he, not one, but two different people. So this is really smart. He's, he's getting better connections. He's gaining more traction, trying to get, bring more figurative and literal ammunition back to the committee to say, hey, you, need, you can't afford to not adopt this rifle. That's what he's going for. And he's going to win them all over with that amazing hat. Okay, so in 1869, he obtains permission to leave Vienna with two Kernka rifles. We're going back to St. Petersburg, folks. Two years later, this is going to go a lot better now. Okay, so on January 23rd, our Baron von Hahn actually submits a written report to the Ministry of War. Remember, we talked about him a little while ago, but his name is Dmitry Milyutin. This was the guy charged with reforming the Russian army. How do you do that? The most probably corrupt, messed up army in human history at that time. <laughs> well, part of the process was looking for a new rifle. Now here pictured, we see a Russian, this was actually really hard to get a picture of, but this is a Russian model 1856 percussion musket. Does it look similar to the rifle we see today? It might, and that's because Basically, the idea for Kernka's design was to convert this pattern, because this is what the Russians had, this is who you're trying to get a contract for, to this rifle we see here today. So from that to that, see that, that to that. All right, well, Von Hahn, remember, he also had the ammunition. So, he's, so you can kind of see where he's going with this. He's like, I got my ammunition. We've already had our talks with Kernka, and he's telling the Dmitry Milyutin that he's saying, you know what? We can get this to work. You need to listen to me. I know this is a corrupt system, but we can get this to work. You need to listen to me, all right? Well, in February, the commission stress tests the Kernka. And apparently this gets interesting is at some point, and I forget if this was in 1867 or 1869, but the Kernka was kind of laying around and the Russians were doing testing on it and they couldn't figure out whose design this was, but they liked it so much. And it actually took a while to figure out who, that this was actually Sylvester Kernka's design. Well, here in February 1869, they stress test it. And well, as you could imagine, based off of our Serbian test where you walk out the tolerances, uh, it works fine. In fact, they, they actually put a cartridge in with three, I think it was three bullets, and it worked fine. Um, and it, it was worked so well that the Grand Duke Nikolai Nikolaevich actually submitted a question to Sylvester Kernka, which is kind of a big deal because this guy's way high up there in the Russian food chain at the time. Directly to Sylvester Kernka, he says, okay, this gun is amazing. It works. We can't get it to fail. It's simple. It's it's like, it's like a wonder weapon. It's like, where did this come from? This is amazing. But what's the catch? Like, why didn't Austria adopt this? Why didn't Serbia adopt this? Why has nobody adopted this? Like, like the Russians aren't dumb, right? You see this really good idea, and it's like, no, nobody... It's sort of like when... It's sort of like when there's, like, a really pretty girl that's deciding to talk to you when there's a lot other, lot more competent, better established, better looking guys out there, and you're like, wait, what's the catch? Like, <laughs> there's something mi I'm missing here, right? 
That's what the Grand Duke was trying to figure out, right? And it makes sense. Now, Kirka could have said, well, they don't like me because I'm Czech and they don't like Slavs. They're all terrible racist pigs. I like his response, though. He says, as a citizen of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, these questions put me in an uncomfortable position. Now, how's that for a non-answer? He could have run for politics. <laughs> he would have won with that hat. Look at that hat. That's an amazing hat. Of course, Grand Duke's got a pretty amazing hat as well. Oh, boy. Hats back then were pretty impressive, folks. Okay, so they're trying to figure out the catch. He's like, eh, I can't really say. So they're like, eh, whatever. We can, we'll go off of what we know, what we have, the testing we've done. And so we form another special commission to, again, look at the Baranov versus the Kernka. And remember, we've already looked at this. And <laughs> I don't know who thought we needed another commission, but apparently we do. There's when in doubt in these military trials, Let's just throw another commission together and delay the process and make it more corrupt. Okay. Well, thankfully, in this case, though, this was kind of a no-brainer. It was the same outcome that you would have expected that we saw before. You have the same fire rate, but the Kernk is significantly cheaper and simpler, and it's going to be easier to produce with what Russia has. Because remember, their factories and the men in their factories are just not up to the competence of some of the European factories, like in Belgium, for instance, is just not on the same level. So the Russians had to work with what they had, right? They had to be able to produce, they had to find something that they could actually produce, which was this particular rifle that happened to come in at the right particular time, at the right particular time when the military reforms were happening, when they needed a gun, and their factories weren't really up to speed where they could produce something really, really fancy, this gun, this from an obscure Czech gunsmith, came in at the perfect time to arm a nation, folks. And so it did. And I'm very happy to report that on March 18th, 1869, Tsar Alexander II formally adopted the model 1869 six-line rifle. So folks, we have the big win finally. 20 years after his first design, Sylvester Kernke gets the big win. Okay, so that's, that's going well for Sylvester Kernke. He is a happy camper. We have a bit of a problem. Remember, we talked about the Russian factories need to be able to have something they can produce, but how do they actually go about producing this rifle? Because you can say, okay, theoretically you could produce this, but still it's going to take a Herculean effort to do this. From, you know, you have your three factories, the Izhevs factory, the Tula factory, and the Sistrayets factory, who are in varying degrees of states right now as far as what they can or can't do. Um, from like a, a skill and a manpower perspective and a training perspective. So even something very simple like this, it's not going to be something you can just snap your fingers and it's going to get done, folks. They needed help. The Russian, the main factories needed help. And thankfully, though, from some of the guys we've been talking about before, help was on the way. But... What we also need to talk about here is the ammunition, first of all. Now, we have some blown up pictures. Remember, they produce different types of ammunition. You have the drawn brass case and you have the rounded, uh, I guess the folded brass case, right? And obviously they needed help. The three main factories couldn't produce all of these cartridges. And that's probably where uh, Sederal and Von Hahn came into play. Um, they were definitely very pivotal. And even if the Russian factories immediately like couldn't, I think after two years, by 1869, they realized we can't, just th we can't just brush this off and say, oh, we can't produce the ammo. I mean, you've got to get to a point where you at least come up with a battle plan to say, we, we're going to adopt. I mean, if you say, no, we can't do it, you're never going to do it. If you say, put a battle plan in place and say, we're going to do this, we're going to figure out a way to do it, it's going to get done one way or another, especially if we're talking about a lot of money involved. Capitalism is a wonderful thing because it can drive innovation, where otherwise there wouldn't exist any. So 
If you're wondering what caliber this is, again, this is in 15.24 by 40 rimmed Kernka. And if you wanna get a weird look from somebody, go into a Walmart at about 3 a.m. in the sporting goods section and find the new guy and ask him with a straight face for two boxes of 15.24 by 40 rimmed Kernka. And that might be funny. I'm sure someone will make a TikTok video out of that one. Uh, but anyway, this is a massive cartridge and it makes sense because again, everything's massive at this time because black powder, you get a lot of fouling. If you have a really small diameter projectile in the bore, the bore is tiny, it's gonna foul up quickly. So you have to have a big projectile. And also you're converting muskets. So that's what the muskets had. If the musket was an eight millimeter, if you're gonna do a conversion, you're gonna use the original barrel well, the conversion is now going to be an eight millimeter as well. So you're just, you're kind of limited by the existing bore diameter for all the rifles that you're converting. Okay, now let's talk about the receiver a little bit, because this is good. This is good. going to be a segue slowly into some of the production issues. It appears, as far as I can tell, that these receivers are not just bronze, but they're phosphor bronze, which is a bronze alloy. Obviously, it's bronze with phosphorus. And I'm not a metallurgist, but the idea is that the phosphor adds strength to the receiver. Makes a lot of sense because bronze is really good for the Russian factories because it's easy to produce. It's going to be something that you can produce relatively cost effectively. At this time, the Russian factories really had no good steel production. All, if you wanted good steel, you had to go get it from Western Europe. So if we have to make a new receiver, this is another reason why Kernka's gun was so well loved. Well, bronze, we're gonna have a lot easier time making than steel receivers. So it's simple, it's easy to manufacture, and then the phosphor is gonna make it stronger. Now, phosphor bronze, we would also see come up in Belgium of all places, where we would see it used in the early production of the Belgian Comblane rifle. Uh, unfortunately for Belgium, this is interesting, they discovered that that didn't work for them, that the receiver strength was not strong enough, so they switched the receiver to steel. Russia didn't do that with the Kirkas. And why? It's anybody's guess. It could, could it have been that these were stronger, that these lasted longer? Sure. Could it have been that the Belgians were just too picky? and the guns didn't have enough longevity for them to warrant production? Perhaps. It was probably a mixture of some of those. Okay, but what's interesting about the Comblains is uh, even though they removed that, the, the barrel bands I think were still produced in phosphor bronze. Although these aren't, these I think are steel barrel bands, but phosphor bronze, really, really interesting thing. Only problem is, no one in Russia has any experience with phosphor bronze. The, the Russian factories, oh, they have no idea how to make this. I mean, they can't make steel, but phosphor bronze, pfft. I mean, you've got totally unexperienced workers at the Ezhev's factory. How are they gonna figure out how to make phosphor bronze receivers? Hmm. This guy is gonna come into play. Remember we keep talking about the Nobel family? Well, Ludwig Nobel is actually gonna come into the picture and save the day because Remember that factory where he started? Well, by this time, they were huge. The, the Ludwig Nobel factory in St. Petersburg was one of the biggest factories in all of Russia. They were producing ev literally everything you could imagine. Um, plumbing components, wheels, cannons, uh, anything you could imagine, basically, they were producing. Well, Ludwig Nobel was so smart, he actually figured out a new way to make phosphor bronze. Hmm. So what ended up happening here, and you can see this wonderful picture of, it appears that that's Ludwig Nobel's house in St. Petersburg adjacent to his factory. Well, Ludwig Nobel, it appears, again, the research is really difficult on this gun, folks. But as far as I can tell, Ludwig Nobel actually produced these receivers for the, th the main three factories. And again, that makes perfect sense because I don't think they knew how to even make these. And he's probably the only one in Russia that could have made these. He saved the day. So 
Could Sylvester Kernke have gotten his rifle adopted without Ludwig Nobel? Hmm. That's a question we're going to start asking ourselves. Another thing we want to look at is the hammer. Now, this is really cool because the hammer on the Kernke rifle is actually uses an existing percussion musket hammer. And they just had to modify it a little bit. They had to give it this little extra bit that's protruding out on the side so it can actually hit the striker as we saw when we took a look up close at this guy. So you can use existing parts, you just have to modify them. This is awesome. Because like, that's not that hard to make in retrospect, but if you can reuse old parts, fantastic. It's gonna save time, it's gonna save money. So this was a really, really clever design by Sylvester Kernke. Now here's the lock assembly of a Kernke. And as far as I can tell, this should basically be the same as a, your standard percussion musket. I don't really see any warrants to need to make any big modifications to this. That's awesome. So you can use your existing locking assembly mostly at least. Okay, so let's talk about Sylvester Kernke's payout now. Um, it seems like he made 2,000 rubles around 1869 for those, those wound cartridges. Um, now, obviously, the big contract came for 25,000 rubles for having his rifle adopted. Um, uh, in 1870, it seems like he got another 4,500 rubles for his cartridge. And then in the years 1870 to 1872, he was actually paid a salary to oversee ammunition production. Because remember, he was a genius. He'd been designed in metallic cartridges for a while, so since the Russians hadn't done it before, he was a pretty useful guy to have around. Remember, he didn't just design the gun, he designed the ammunition as well. Okay. And to also put this in perspective, Edouard de Stokel, um, who was basically the Russians broker for the Alaska deal to, to sell Alaska to America, he was actually paid the same amount Kernka was, 25,000 rubles. So it you know, helps put that in perspective a little bit. Okay, so how many rifles were produced here? Well, from 1869 to 1871, this gets crazy because remember we talked about we have the Izhevs factory, the Sistrayetsk factory, and the Tula factory. Those would be tasked with doing conversions, but also with producing new rifles. So this, get, this is where this gets, gun gets really strange, folks, because some of these guns are conversions from percussion muskets. Some of these guns, and this one is, as far as I can tell, is actually a brand new rifle that's not a conversion. From the stamp here, it's from 1870. So there's a wide variance here, but the thing was... The main factories were the only factories allowed to produce new rifles. But they needed help because they just couldn't bear the brunt of this. This was such a huge undertaking to convert all their percussion muskets to this pattern. So we lend the help of a few more factories. Now, number one, the Nobel plant in St. Petersburg, Ludwig Nobel's factory, would actually produce... So I've seen 90,000, I've also seen 100,000, so somewhere in there pr would actually do the conversions of these rifles. I think, I far as I can tell, they were just conversions, not new rifles, although it's kind of funny because they were probably more capable in many aspects than um, some of the, at least maybe the Ejevs factory was. Because Ludwig Nobel even had his own tools for uh, cutting rifling in barrels. I mean, this guy was a genius at what he did, and he was very, very successful. All right, and the other thing I want to mention that Ludwig Nobel did was he also incorporated a lot of positive changes into the work culture. He introduced a lot of, like, schooling programs, benefits, time off. This was stuff that, you know, five or ten years before this would have been just unheard of in Russia. He really paved the way for change and gave hope to a lot of people that previously had no hope in enslavement, in a very poor, uh, 
place to live and very poor life expectancies. So what Ludwig Nobel did, I cannot stress enough, is absolutely incredible and crucial to the history of Russia as a whole. But we have some other factories as well. We have one called the Meinhardt, and I can't figure out exactly where that was, but they also produced about 90,000 rifles. Again, conversions. Here we're talking about conversions of muskets. We have a plant in Latvia, modern day Latvia, called Rohnfeld and Schmelzer. We don't exactly know how many they produced. It was probably in the tens of thousands would be my guess, but it's really hard to say. Um, we also have the workshop of Lieutenant General Standerschild in modern day Tbilisi, Georgia. They produced about 20,000 of these rifles, again, conversions. Uh, and in Kiev, we would have Theodore Menike's workshop convert. It probably, it's, the data is really hard to find, folks, but it seems they are converted about 90,000 rifles in Kiev. So you can see this is like a worldwide affair. This is going on all over the place, all parts of the empire. And in Warsaw, we had an armaments workshop that allegedly produced 34,941, which for the time period and the data I have is an oddly specific number. Eh. Now, when we talk about grand totals, though, this gets conflicting. I've seen 334,941 rifles produced, but then I also see 443,000, and then I also see 900,000. So chances are, when we talk about conversions from these factories, it's probably one of these numbers is going to be accurate. But when we bring in the other factories, the main factories, the Tula, Izhevsk, and Sistrayetsk, I don't exactly know how many they produced, but we know they produced many new ones as well as performing conversions themselves. So it seems to be somewhere between half a million to a million of these rifles were produced. That's a lot of rifles, folks. And it's especially interesting given how rare this rifle is today because they produced a ton of these. Why are these rifles so incredibly rare? Well, we might get a little bit more of a glimpse of that when we get to and past episode three, but just some food for thought there. So what were some of the problems of this design? Um, well, there's really only one big problem, which was that when they found after, after they would put these into service, remember a lot of these were converted off of existing worn out muskets and the bores were really shot out. They had rifling, but they were really shot out and the dimensions were a little bit wider and out of spec of the norm. And when they took their standard ammunition and they loaded it into these worn out Kirka, these newly produced Kirkas with worn out barrels, this is weird, a new gun with a worn out barrel, they found that the accuracy was no good. Because remember, the bore was wider than it should have been, so it wasn't getting positive engagement with the rifling like it should have been. Obviously, you're going to get inaccuracy. So their fix to that was really just increase the diameter of their projectile a little bit, and that seemed to really fix it for the most part. Hey, it's a Band-Aid, but if it works, it works. As we're going to see here, remember, three guns we're looking at that are going to lead us up to the Russo-Turkish War of 1877. This gun was sort of the big Band-Aid. Now, I, I feel a little bad about saying that because this is such an important gun and Sylvester Kirka's work is so critical. But specifically for the Russians, this was not the end-all long-term solution for their problems. But this was a big band-aid. I mean, if you're producing half a million to close to a million rifles, this is a this is a big deal. And I want to say one more thing for Sylvester Kirk's work, because I don't think I've done a good job of stressing this until now. Sylvester, the genius of Sylvester Kirk's work is that it's sort of like we look at a gun, this is an actual physical gun with an actual design, but his design wasn't necessarily so much a actual dimension blueprint of this rifle. It was almost more of an abstract idea that on a whim, give him a gun, he could apply that abstract idea to that particular gun and convert it into his pattern of rifle. 
So that was the real genius of this. It, it wasn't so, the parameters of his design weren't so fixed that it would only work on one gun. This would, his, this is what he harped on for 20 years. His design would work on any musket. Any, you give him a musket, he's gonna give you back a breech loading rifle. Genius. And it worked, it let him, it let him put all his cards on the table, spread them out everywhere, until something stuck, and this stuck, folks. So here's something really interesting. Now I found this article in the New York Herald, which is an American magazine from November 1st, 1871, and it actually talks about the Russian army being armed. So here it says, um, the mo Russian army is mostly armed with a breech loader known as the Kurnka rifle, Several divisions, however, have the Karla rifle. Now, we haven't talked much about the Karla rifle, and we're not going to focus on it, but just know the Karla rifle was also a conversion of a musket, but it was a lot worse. It was actually a needle-fired conversion, kind of like the, the Dreyse, but it was, it was weird, like kind of steampunk crazy, not, not really a good solution, but they did have some. Uh, and then they have some with the Baranov, some with the Berdan, American, and it gives the numbers here. We have 30,000 Berdan rifles. We have 400,000 Kernka rifles, which by 1871 kind of goes with what we were saying with those numbers before. Um, 209,000 Karla rifles, which is quite a lot. I have a hard time believing it was that much, but I guess maybe it was. And then we have 30,000 Baranov rifles. Um, so it, it's interesting to me that this info is in an American magazine in 1871. Why? I don't really know, but since I found it, I thought I would show it to y'all. How accurate are these numbers? <sighs> I don't know, folks. Russian history from this time period it could be so... like It's almost like playing a game with telephone, right? You talk to 10 different people and each person says something else to another one, and by the time you get to the end, the message is totally different from when you started. That's kind of the game we play here. So trying to, what you have to do is cross-reference stuff and say, okay, well, this source says that, that says that, that says that, but that can be difficult when there's only one or two sources that even have information on a particular subject. <sighs> this is really difficult research, folks, but we do our best here. So they had at least 400,000 probably in 1871. Um, and now here, this is again, this is a blown up picture. This is Ludwig Nobel's house and factory uh, around 1870. I think that's his house and that's his factory. Again, he, had, he, he was amazing to his workers. He had improved their living conditions, their quality of life. This was just unheard of. His idea was he was gonna change the culture in Russia. And he, if he didn't, he at least started it, where at least it was there so people could see it. It was something that nobody had seen before. So Ludwig Nobel's factory, even before the, the arise of the Kernke rifle, you had people flocking in droves from the miseries of that subsistence farming life post uh, emancipation, flocking to these, uh, industrial centers like in St. Petersburg to work for people, really Ludwig Nobel, because there weren't really too many people like Ludwig Nobel. So really, I see him as just a lighthouse, a beacon of hope for these oppressed people. And he gave them hope in partly in producing the Kernke rifle. That's pretty cool. Okay, so let's take a look at some of the markings now on the Kernke, because this gets a little weird. Now on this example, you'll see it has two serial numbers here on the bronze receiver. Why? I'm not 100% sure, but as far as I can tell, the two serial numbers indicates that it was a conversion. So one serial number represents the original serial number of the percussion musket that it had. The other serial number represents the uh, serial number of the new Kernka rifle. So now you have two serial numbers. That's not weird at all. Eh, not something you typically see, but as far as I can tell, that's probably what that means. And it's kind of cool. And since we only have one serial number on this gun and the fact that it was made in 1870, 
pretty good chance this was just a newly manufactured rifle that we have here today. Okay, now here's a marking from the Sistrayets factory. Now we see here, it looks like it says C03-1861. So here in Cyrillic, C actually means S. So this C stands for Sistrayets factory. The zero is, uh, stands for Aruzhine, which is Russian for weapons. And then the three is actually a Russian Z, which stands for Zavat, which of course is going to be factory. So this is Sistrayetsk Weapons Factory is what this stands for. And this is really typical of the early um, Russian rifles from the, like, the 1800s, or, like early to mid 1800s, all the way to the Kernka. You would see these abbreviations for the factories. Uh, the Tula factory is a similar story. You just have an M. O3. Now the M is interesting because in like handwritten Russian, a T looks like an M. <laughs> I don't, I don't know why, but it does. So that's actually a T. So this is Tula Weapons Factory, 1859. And since it's dated 1859, we know that this gun would be a conversion because they weren't making Kirka rifles in 1859, obviously. Here's another interesting one. Maybe you've heard of the company BSA, Birmingham Small Arms. Well, some Kernkas have been found, well, the few that have been found today, it seems that some of them are, are marked BSA. So BSA, as far as we know, they didn't actually produce Kernka rifles, but Kernka rifles were made from BSA produced muskets that apparently Russia had. Kind of interesting, there's more of a story here that needs to be unfolded, but that's about all the info I have on it at the moment. But we are actually gonna see BSA in another uh, episode because in episode three, we're gonna see that they almost go bankrupt because of Russia. Stay tuned for that. Okay, now Ludwig Nobel has some neat markings. We can see on top of the breach here, we have L. Nobel, and that of course is in Russian, and it also says C N uh, B, I think. Well, what that actually stands for is so that C, that's S, that's Saint, and then that's P in Russian, so Saint Petersburg. That it's usually abbreviated S P B. Um, so it's uh, Ludwig Nobel, Saint Petersburg. Now. Did he make this actual gun? Because we know the, two, the Ijez factory made this, but we don't know some of the other parts. I don't see any of these sorts of markings on this rifle, but again, this one's really worn. They could be there, they could have been there at some point. I just don't see any on this one like that. Uh, here's a closer look, and we can see our proof commission crest here on the top of the bronze receiver as well. Pretty cool stuff. All right, now here's something really interesting. This is actually Sylvester Kernka's house in Prague, and you can actually go visit it today. So apparently this is where he lived in 1871. Uh, he would have lived here while he was overseeing the Russian ammunition production. Remember, because he got paid that salary for that three-year window. And I'm actually gonna show you where this is today. I'm gonna switch over here to maps. So here we are, this is the Atlantic Ocean, this is Europe, and we're actually gonna go visit Prague right now. So we're gonna go here. Now here's Germany, this is the modern day Czech Republic. Here's Prague. And if you go here, zoom in, what we wanna do is find a, a cross street, so where two streets hit each other. This J Masarika, and where it meets this street here, which is Shafarikova. Okay, and the corner is actually right here. So I'm gonna zoom out one more time, and zoom in all the way in here. And I have it marked here. There's a weird modern day business here called advanced training, which I can use for reference. But if I scroll over here, I can pull out street view and I can actually show you this. All right, so now we're in modern day Prague. And I'm gonna move around here a little bit. And look at that, folks. 
That wonderful pink building is Sylvester Kernke's house. It's actually quite big. Now, 1871, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure that's fairly new by Prague standards. Prague's like one of the oldest cities in Europe, so this is actually a pretty new building. But I can go, the, let's go the wrong way on a one-way street now in Prague without getting arrested. There's a Volvo outside of Sylvester Kernke's house. There's his doors. I don't know if those are the original doors or what. We can see there's his windows. It looks like he had a basement. And we can, if we go a little further, we can see like this is a really big complex. Like see, it goes around here as well. And see, it goes, it, it, it goes down there. So I think this is, so this area here, I'm not certain if this is part of his house. Um, if any of y'all are ever in Prague, though, I'd like you to go visit this and you can give me more info on it because it looks like a really interesting place. But Sylvester Kernke of this rifle was here and lived here. It's talking about history is one thing. And I know this may seem a little pointless, but this is like a tangible connection we have to Sylvester Kernke with this rifle and that building. So it's important to appreciate history while we still have it. And if we can touch it, actually go touch the bricks where Sylvester Kernke lived, I just think that's kind of cool, folks. All right, so we'll go back here. Uh, so we, we've seen his house. Um, here's his workshop from 1876. This doesn't look quite as nice. Uh, he did some other things after this, but you know, nothing too, too crazy. We will see though, he actually invented a speed loader. Although I'm not really sure if it was a, really adopted by the Russian army. His idea was you would have a, a packet of ammunition attached to the side of your rifle. So that way when you, sh when you wanna shoot, you would just pull out a cartridge and load it instead of having to like reach down in your bag because you see what I did there? Um, I had to look away from any potential threats down in my bag, whereas if I'm here, it's gonna be faster and I get to maintain a sight picture of any potential threats. So that was a really cool design. Very simple, but really cool. But of course, you know how invent inventors are after they make it big and retire, they still have to tinker around. So this is where he tinkered around here in the Czech Republic. And I even found a plan of the sewage treatment of his lot from, when is this, 1941? I just threw that in there because I figured two people would probably get a kick out of that. I know I did. Uh, one other weird thing I wanted to show you that I found this in the Bolivar Bulletin from Bolivar, Tennessee. Maybe one of our viewers have been there. I, I don't know, I've never been to Bolivar, Tennessee. I found a weird newspaper article titled Sylvester Kernke, a murderous weapon. And then it goes on to say, M. Kernke, and I guess that's just a typo because I don't know how many other Kernkes there are who invented a breech loader that was adopted by the War Department of St. Petersburg. So M is just a mistake. It should be S. Kernke. He says, has just published a pamphlet in Prague in which he describes a new invention of his called the Coulomet or hand mitraille. I don't speak French, but that's the best I can do. The Coulomet, he says, is of simple construction and may be used by the soldier on any ground, however hilly, just like a rifle. It is comparatively cheaper and simpler than the Verndel. Remember the Verndel? That was what the Austro-Hungarians went with. Breech loader used by European armies. And a soldier armed with it can, under all circumstances, fire thrice as rapidly as with the Zund... Nagdelgver, Zundanalgver. I'm not sure what that is in reference to, but apparently there existed something called the Zundanalgver, where this could, the Kulamet, Sylvester Kernke's deadly Kulamet, could fire three times as fast. <laughs> okay. Um, in battle, it will fire 24 shots a minute, while other breech loaders only fire from 12 to 13. And remember, we already said this one's like nine. Depends on the person, but if this is nine, and whatever we're talking about here, he designed is 24. And remember, this is only like three years after this gun was produced. I don't know how exactly this crazy thing worked, but it sounds very impressive, and I wish I had a picture of it, because I'd love to show it to y'all. 
but I don't. I just have a newspaper article from the Boulevard Bulletin. You find history in the weirdest places, folks. I love it. So how do we wrap all of this up that we've talked about here today? Because the Kernka, we haven't talked about it really, about how it performed a lot in Russian service and where it was used. We're going to get there in episode three. Remember, we got to get to our other two rifles. And then once we have our three rifles, we really get to talk about Russia as a whole going forward towards the Mosin Nagant, which is what this whole process is really about, folks. But what I can tell you is that this rifle is really a symbol. Um, it's, very, it's a very rare symbol, but it's a symbol, and it symbolizes hope. Remember, in this time period, the Russian people, if, if there were anyone that would be hopeless, it would be the Russian people in about 18, the mid-1860s. With just, you know, this extreme debt, with no land, and barely getting by. This rifle represents the transition from an old age to a new age, and with that comes hope. Through, for the, for the Russian people, that hope comes through the inventiveness of one obscure Czech gunsmith named Sylvester Kernke, and the ingeniousness of one inventor by the name of Ludwig Nobel, and how they came together to start Russia forward after the tragedies of the Crimean War and onward towards a new horizon of redemption, hope, and ultimately revenge. Thanks to the efforts of Sylvester Kernke and Ludwig Nobel, Russia is finally on track and back on the road to redemption. They are finally moving now into the industrial age. But Russia still adopted two more rifles that we need to talk about in this time period. And both of these rifles that we're going to be talking about come courtesy of an extremely quirky American inventor this time by the name of Hiram Burdan.